Hello, everyone. Welcome to Beyond Surviving, the safe space for survivors of childhood sexual abuse to receive support, resources, and share their stories. Beyond Surviving is about freedom, healing, connection, and even laughter and fun. Most importantly, it's about letting go of the pain of abuse and finally moving on. I'm Rachel Grant, and for those of you who don't yet know me, I've been a sexual abuse recovery coach since 2007, and I'm the author of Beyond Surviving, The Final Stage of Recovery from Sexual Abuse. I work with survivors who are sick and tired of feeling broken and unfixable, and I help them let go of the pain of abuse and finally feel normal. You can learn more about me and the Beyond Surviving program at www.rachelgrantcoaching.com. So today, folks, I am really thrilled to have here with me my guest, Robert Young, Marathon Man UK, who's going to be sharing with us about his upbringing and the ability to run a marathon a day. That's right, every day, day after day. (laughs) So we're in for a real treat as we get to know Rob today. Um, I want to tell you a little bit more about him before I bring him on the line. Rob's father was abusive and essentially made his life a living hell. As a young child, Rob witnessed some really terrible things, some things that, you know, most of us would even find really hard to imagine, including the sexual assault of his sister, the torture of his mother, and even the senseless killing of the family dog. And he wasn't spared from this. You know, he was also tortured on a daily basis. At about age eight, he was put into an orphanage and before being fostered at age 12. Then at 17, Rob entered the British Army, the Royal Corps of Signals. And during that time, that's really when he found his feet in the sporting world and went on to represent Great Britain at junior level in biathlon, which is like a run, swim, run, and was also selected for the Great Britain junior duathlon team. And in the end, he focused on the triathlon and represented Great Britain, um, winning the 2004 European Long Distance Triathlon Bronze Medal uh, in Germany. And so he's just had this really wonderful career and journey. And in 2014, he actually quit his job and started running full time and essentially just hasn't stopped. (laughs) So um, there's no getting these running shoes off this guy. Um, And since then, he's visited hundreds of schools, really bringing a message to them and leaving them feeling inspired, and has raised over 160,000 pounds for children's charities around the world. So he is up to so much, and I'm just really excited to um, have him here to share his story and more about what he's up to these days. Rob, welcome. Thanks so much for being here. No, thank you for having me on. Awesome. So I want to just start with understanding a little bit about, um, you know, what you've been up to over the last year. You know, when you when you talk about running a marathon every single day, um, what is that all about for you? Yeah, so it all started with a bet from my partner and I. Um, it was a 20p bet, and she said that I couldn't run a marathon. And I said I could. And the bet went on. It went from 10 to 20. It went up to 50. And then it just blossomed into this uh, running a marathon a day. And I was going all over the world, uh, competing in different races, uh, just to try and fit all these marathons in. Uh, It got to a point where I started to um, dabble in ultra marathons. And I was basically running anywhere between uh, a marathon and 110 mar- uh, 10 miles a day, every single day. Uh, from there, uh, went over to America and ran the transcontinental race, which is a 3,100 mile race from LA all the way to Washington DC, going into the southern routes down into Texas and Mississippi and uh, Alabama, all those states over there. And it, it was absolutely remarkable. Each state was a different country to me. It was, it was just, mm-hmm. it just seemed so different. And it was absolutely stunning. Uh, from there, I came back to the UK, and uh, I was very lucky to, uh, obviously, I, I won the transcontinental race and won that by about 30 hours. Uh, and then from there, I came back, and I managed to run the longest run in history without sleeping um, of 373.75 miles. 
so that was from Tuesday morning from 9.30 in the morning all the way through to Saturday 1 a.m. So I was, I, I've been very lucky wow. over this this entire period and I went on to do some other bits and pieces but I won't bore you with all of those but they're, they're the main things that I've gone and done and, and I've been very lucky to, to, to have the opportunity to do them and, and obviously uh, try and inspire people along the way. Awesome. Wow, I love how just, you know, uh, what starts off as an innocent, playful bet <laughs> ends up kind of totally transforming um, your life in many ways and, and takes you into this journey and into this adventure. And, you know, one of the things that I'm really curious about is, you know, we talked. I talked just very briefly about some of the experiences that you had in childhood with abuse. And I'm curious how that has played a part in this journey that you've been on of running uh, a marathon every day. Yes. Um, so, you know, a lot of people say, does it have um, resemblance to trying to get over to something? Are you trying to get over uh, something in your past? It's not. It was a it was a harmless bet between me and uh, me and my partner. Um, at the time, I was running a multi million pound. Um, car company uh, for an elderly gentleman. So I, I was in a very, very good position and a very good job. Um, and I just so happened that I've always wanted to do a long distance event. I've always wanted to challenge my body. I've always wanted to raise money uh, for children uh, in many different circumstances all mm-hmm. over the world. Uh, and this was my opportunity to do that. And I suppose it as, as something, I mean, I, I, I've always wanted from the age of 10 to be able to connect with children to try and help them out. Um, and it's probably because I have had a very tough upbringing myself. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. I think that it was more so the bet that um, allowed me to um, to do this uh, for my partner. Otherwise, I wouldn't have gone on to do do the things. And, and obviously, the I'm very lucky to discover a talent uh, within running uh, where I can actually keep running and, and, uh, and actually keep going at a, a good pace. Um, you know, it's, it's a lot of people um, wonder whether I'm trying to escape something, uh, but I'm not. Mm. You know, a lot of people are ashamed. You know, they're, they're, it's, it's not right. about coming out with their story. They're ashamed to tell their story. They're ashamed to tell someone. They're ashamed about what's happened in the past. Don't be ashamed. You know, you shouldn't be the one what's ashamed about sharing your story. You weren't able to control those circumstances at that time, in that moment in, in, in history, if we can say that. You know, and I didn't have the opportunity yeah. to, to protect myself because I was too young to do so. Um, you know, so I'm not ashamed about, about that. I've gotten over everything. I'm able to talk about it. I'm able to move on. And actually, in the end, I've actually forgiven my father uh, as hard as, as you know, the stuff that we will talk about you know, it's very hard hitting to most people, but I've actually been able to manage to overcome it and forgive. And the thing is that the, I think the hardest thing to do is to give someone for doing those things and to also mm-hmm. stop being, uh, or stop having those feelings of being ashamed because you know what, it's not your fault. Nothing that you okay. could have done to prevent that. Yeah, thank you for that, Rob, because I think this is a, it is a very key piece in any person's journey of healing from abuse of any type that we take on, you know, the ownership of what happened um, and lose sight of the fact that we were children, we were young, there wasn't anything that we could do to prevent that. So thank you for being a voice here um, to really encourage um, everybody who's listening that, you know, if you're in that place where you just really believe that everything was your fault, um, there is a way to the other side of that where you don't feel that. Rob, was there anything that you think of very in particular that helped you really get that, like, deep down that it wasn't your fault? Was there any particular uh, moment in your life or something that happened or just something that you learned that helped you to really get that? I suppose I was very lucky. Um, I mean, let me take you back a bit about my life so you can understand me a bit more and the stuff that I went through. Yeah. You know, I, I, I grew up with my father hitting me, um, you know, not just hitting me, but throwing me down the stairs to putting me in a suitcase, throwing me down the stairs, hitting me with planks of wood, making me bleed, punching me, kicking me. Um, everything you can think about, I had a nail hammered through my foot into the banister 
Um, I was dangled mm. by one leg over the banister, threatened to be stopped or even punched um, uh, in the chest or the belly by my father. And if I tried or screamed or made a sound or even closed my eyes, he would drop me. You know, mm. I had to learn um, certain techniques. I had to learn how to focus. I mean, one of the things that I did was try and push all my emotions and thoughts to the back of my head and leave the front head. You know, I talk about, I, I call it the lock state. You know, I'm, I yeah. hope I'm not divulging from, from our talk, but I'm, I've got to tell you all the things about me and what I try to do uh, for you to get a, a, a clear understanding. You know, I went into my lock state when he was doing those things. I was getting, um, you know, I was trying to push everything to, back, to the back of my head to try and shadow uh, what was happening. Um, from there, I watched, the, um, uh, watched my dog being uh, murdered uh, by my father. Uh, I watched my dad rape my sister multiple times. He, he actually forced me to sit there, uh, tie me down at the chair uh, some of the times. I watched my mum get burnt. I watched my mum get tortured. Um, and, and I was very lucky eventually to escape that. Um, oh. it, it so happened that the very last time that uh, that was, or my very last beating was that he actually hung me on a, a coat railing um, and left me dangling there. And um, I was actually very glad uh, to be in that moment because I knew, uh, I didn't know what death was. I didn't know these things because I was, I was always kept inside the house um, by my father. I was never allowed to experience what life is. I wasn't able to understand exactly what's going on. What was happening inside the house, I thought everyone outside was having exactly the same happen to them. So I thought right. it was very normal, you know. And, um, you know, to be hanging there, I was glad. I knew that what happened to my dog, um, that he never came back. And therefore, if I had the same experience, maybe all this pain and hurt will go away. So I was rather glad hanging there. And then um, uh, after a little while, when you start panicking, I was trying to stay calm. I was trying to stay in my locked state. He came in and hit me, and then I lost my lock state. I lost um, uh, you know, trying to control everything, control the pain, control. I, I mm -hmm. broke out of my lock state, and I was like panicking. I was wondering, how am I going to get back in? And I had to go back into another routine, and I tried to focus. And, and you know, if you look at the bottom of your nose and just try and focus on, on the nose or trying to imagine... I mean, as an old adult now, I would try and imagine somewhere nice and peaceful, somewhere perfect and tranquil where I absolutely love to try and uh, refocus, to try and get myself, in, I call it the, you know, you've got to try and focus yeah. to get out of that pain. Um, yeah. And I wasn't able to get out of that pain. I wasn't able to lock it back, lock myself back away in my own head, to uh, lock myself back away and, and, and get away all the pain. Um, and then all of a sudden I start panicking and then he came in and he held my legs and then eventually cut the rope. And um, uh, that was the very last beating that I had, um, along with other things that mm. were happening at the time. Um, and then from there, I, I decided I had to escape. I had to get away somehow. Uh, one night after about two weeks of actually recovering from this actual beating, um, I went downstairs to the shed. Um, uh, I knew there was a big ax there. I knew that I could grab it. I knew if I hit him hard enough with it, I knew something was going to happen and therefore I, I should be able to escape. He should um, uh, be hurt enough for us to be able to get out of the house and, and, and basically escape. Um, got halfway up the stairs and my mum caught me, uh, stopped me at the top of the stairs uh, and, and said, that's it, we're going to leave, we're definitely leaving. So she had the courage at that time, even though she was very weak and, 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 and very, I suppose, she was manipulated. She was completely mm -hmm. manipulated into everything about yeah. my father. So we were very lucky to get away. We, we, we ran away, uh, walked a couple hundred miles down a motorway to escape. Um, you know, and then I was taken off into an orphanage. And then I got bullied again. I, I, I was getting hit and everything else. Um, and then from there, I actually then became the bully to actually learn, um, or I learned how to stop those things from happening to me. So bullying allowed me to stop people bullying me. Um, and I did that for a little while. And the changing point in my life was when someone said to me in the children's zone, you'll turn out like your father if you continue what you're doing. And I mm. was not at one point in my life ever going to be like my father. From that mm. moment on, I changed my life. 
I changed and yeah. I transformed. At the age, at the age of ten, I I, I wanted to uh, create self-sustaining schools all over the world, and I'm in the process of doing various bits and pieces to to hopefully make my childhood dream come true, which will wow. help hopefully thousands of other children all over the world. Oh my goodness. Well, thank you, Rob, just for letting us into, um, you know, your story and into your life and how, you know, from this place of adversity and just pain and fear um, that you've been able to really step into something that is having a huge impact on the lives of children. I'm curious, when you started, um, you know, out from this vet and doing the running, did was it immediately in your mind that this could become something that you, you could use as a platform for raising awareness, raising a funds for charities, or did that come later on? Yeah, so it, it was pretty much a case of I wanted to raise some money for charity. I wanted to raise a little bit of money. Mm-hmm. Um, and I was very lucky to go on and raise, um, I think, around about £160,000 now um, for quite a few different charities um, all over the world. Um, you know, in America, I raised for a charity called the 100 Mile, uh, 100 Mile Club, uh, which uh, tries to get children active um, through running uh, within schools. Uh, so... It wasn't a set plan. It was more of a case that it was a challenge, and then it, it was just there and then. It just all clicked in me. It was, oh my goodness, I can raise money for children's charities. Let's do it. Oh my goodness, I'm, I've got a, a challenge to do something really long. Let's do it. Mm-hmm. You know, all mm-hmm. my dreams that I thought about and um, that came true right there, right in front of oh, me. Okay. And it was a case of I need to break through these barriers to be able to get to that point to actually go on and keep doing it every single day. And that's what people happen. People in life build up barriers. Oh, I'm going to wait until tomorrow to do that. I'm going to wait until next week to do that. You Mm -hmm. keep building a barrier and you keep building a barrier and then eventually there's too many barriers to break through and you can't break through them. And and unfortunately, you know, you'll be stuck stuck in the same life over and over if you don't go and break break those barriers down and go for whatever you want to do. Because you know what? You know, I don't think that if you go and do something, you're not failing at it because it's something that you wanted to do. And I think even if it turns out to be a wrong thing, I think it's still a positive thing because you've gone and broken away from those barriers and you've yeah. accepted in life. And that's all I've, uh, all I've done. I've just broken those barriers. I'm doing what mm-hmm. I really want to do. Um, and I'm actually just being the truthful person who I am. Beautiful. So, you know, you shared a little bit there about how you use this lock state, as you call it, kind of dissociating or freezing to to separate from the pain that you were experiencing. Do you find that that ability has helped you? Is that a part of, like, the techniques that you use to block out the pain when it it comes to running a marathon and day after day after day? How do you do do that? How do you actually physically manage to, to do this? Yeah, so, you know, there's a couple of techniques. Um, the first one, um, which I learned when I was very young, was called, oh, I call it the lock state. It's about locking yourself inside your head, locking yourself in, trying to block everything out outside of you away. And, and all I do is I focus um, and try and think as if I'm pushing everything in my head to the back of my head. And I try and think that my front of the head is empty, everything what's painful and emotional is at the back. and mm. But yet I'm still focusing, um, I'm focusing on everything at the back of my head, but still able to talk and understand and, and actually interact with the surroundings, even though I'm trying to focus and lock away all the pain. So that's one of the things that I, I do. It takes practice to do to try and lock in those emotions. The other one is just trying to focus. You know, if you can't do the locking one, it's to try and focus on something, focus on some point around the house, focus on your nose, focus on a part of your body, you know, and, and by focusing, you actually try and, uh, you actually send a, I, I mean, I'm, I'm no expert in this field, but I'm just saying now what happens with me when I try and mm-hmm. block things out. If, let's say I've got pain in my left hand, but I'm focusing on my right hand, the pain which you have in your left hand will decrease purely because you're focusing on another part of your body. And the right. other thing is, is, is um, uh, 
Uh, you have to have a couple of tricks. You know, if you let's say have a sharp pain in your left left hand, and it's it's when I, when something was happening with my father, when he did something which was very painful to a certain part of my body, I tried to distract myself, and by distracting myself, I would bite my lip, or I would uh, sort of pinch myself. I'd try and stick my nail into my hand somewhere else. And that deflects the pain from one part of the body to another part of the body. Able to deflect the pain. And by deflecting the pain, that, that intensity of the pain in your body to a smaller amount. Now, the other one that you can use, which is also quite good. I mean, I don't use it that often. Um, but let's say you are going through some kind of chronic pain or you're going through some kind of serious pain. The other one is to try and do something like a game. I call it the imagination um, uh, sort of technique. I mean, I don't know what you would call it, but that's what I would call it because that's what it is. You try and imagine something. For me, there was a beautiful place called Innerstadt in Germany, a game where I went and won the um, European bronze medal in triathlon many, many years ago. Uh, that was in the long distance. That was from my age group. Uh, but it was very beautiful. There was a, a really nice walkway into the water, Underneath is all lit up on the uh, by lights. You can see all the fish swimming around. The lake mm -hmm. is then surrounded by massive amounts of greenery, green trees going on for a couple of miles. And then behind that, you see all the ice mountains, all the snow mountains behind that all the way around. And you just sit there. They've got lovely lights. They've got some lovely chairs to sit on. And you're sitting in the middle of the lake looking up at beautiful stars, looking at the mountains um, in the background, the trees and everything around it is just so beautiful. So if you try and focus on something like that, something which is so beautiful and remarkable, you can actually deflect a lot of the pain as well within your body um, by using that technique. Um, so yeah, so th that's some of the techniques that I try, try to use, which are, I think, very, very useful to, to other people. Absolutely, yeah, just as you were sharing that, Rob, I was thinking, okay, you know, how can this uh, translate to, um, you know, survivors who are in their pain? Um, it's a sometimes a mental emotional pain and sometimes a physical pain because we know that as a result of abuse, many times survivors have chronic pain, have fibromyalgia, have other things um, in their body. And so I love the translation of how we can turn our focus um, is really what I hear in many of those techniques. Shifting your focus from ruminating on the thing that's hurting towards um, something else. And in doing that, it helps to alleviate the pain. That's, that's so. really, yeah. yeah. I really think oh. so. And, and the other thing is, you know, you, you asked me earlier, um, do I use my techniques for when I'm running? When I got to a point where I started to have um, a couple of broken bones in my legs, I, yes, I had to use a couple of techniques to try and block out, the point, uh, block out the pain to keep going within my challenge because at that point I was so far into my challenge, I didn't want it to stop. Um, mm -hmm. I ended up having to have a couple of weeks break and then continue with my challenge, which I actually, I was so far ahead of, of target anyway by that point that I was able to have those couple of weeks break. But... I was probably running on broken legs um, or one broken leg for three weeks, I think. And that uh -huh. was by using my blocking out technique. Obviously, I had to use painkillers as well as trying to use my blocking out techniques because it wasn't enough to, to curb the pain. So I was trying to use painkillers with uh, my technique of trying to block out pain or trying to focus. When I'm, when I'm running, I do something um, I call the double reverse psychology. Um, very, very simple. It says it's right there on the tin. Basically, I try to manipulate someone else's mind by running up to them and I'll, I'll do something like, I love you, baby. Or if I know them, <laughs> they'll they jump over me and, you know, we'll have a laugh, I'll have a joke. And because I'm always trying to focus on those people, on the other runners, and trying uh -huh. to, allow to to have an easier time um, whilst running, try and take their mind away from the running so then it becomes easier for them and, and actually um, allows them to go further in the race a lot, a lot faster by doing that. But it also allows me to manipulate my own mind because I'm mm -hmm. always trying to what am I going to do for the next person? What am I going to do next? 
um, am I just going to stick to the same thing? And because I'm constantly trying to do something or constantly saying hi or constantly trying to do something to another runner, it's completely breaking my mind away from the running aspect and therefore relieving right. the pain or relieving the, um, I suppose, the, um, the amount of running that I'm doing. Um, it just adds a bit more of a fun element and that's the key about running so many marathons a day, every single day uh, for a year or however long you want to do it. It's about how much fun can you make it, you know, how much fun can you make it for yourself but also for other people. And that's the same thing when I go into schools. You know, I ask kids, especially in America and in, in the UK, I say, um, uh, who likes uh, running? And only a couple of hands go up. And then you, mm -hmm. you say, who likes, um, let's say, American football or soccer or, um, uh, you know, all these other hockey or, or all these other sports. And the number one aspect of all those sports is a ball or is a, a, an apparator. Um, uh, but the actual number one actual aspect of those sports is actually running. And that mm -hmm. ball never is the manipulation of the mind. And, yeah. and it's very, very remarkable that if you took away that ball um, and made them run the same mileage as if they did whilst playing that game, I bet you half of them won't be able to reach that mileage because mm -hmm. that manipulation is taken away from them. And it's how right. can we get that manipulation into them and the only way by doing that is make running fun, fun for everyone to do. That, that's true. I, I try and allow my mind to try and manipulate other people's minds to make it fun for them and make it fun for me. Awesome. Well, uh, you know, what, I, what comes up for me as you say that is, you know, everybody who is on a journey, who is on, uh, you know, in this process of healing and trying to get to a destination, so to speak, that, you know, there are broken legs along the way. There are things that are really hard. There are those obstacles and those challenges. And what I really love that you're giving us today is, um, you know, this opportunity that healing and journeys don't have to be these, you know, terrible, heart-wrenching, um, you know, this is something that, you know, I'm very much attuned to, um, that, you know, healing can include laughter. It can include fun. It can include moments of, you know, joy and excitement that it doesn't always have to be this burdensome thing. Um, and so I really love that philosophy that you're going out and, and sharing with, with children. And so just as we start to wrap up today, I'd love to hear, you know, what's next for you? Where are you going from here? What's, um, what's in your immediate future, your long-term future? What's your, your vision for how you want to, you know, build on this momentum and, and use it out in the world to make a difference? Yeah, well, first thing is to keep going to school. For me, it's about seeing those kids, um, to tell them about my backstory. By telling my backstory, it brings them hope. And that's what we all mm -hmm. need. We need a bit of hope. So I bring my backstory for, for those kids that are going through a bad time or, or young adults. I'm bringing my story out to, to the end. Look, this is what I've been through. You can get over these things. Stop being ashamed and stop letting people manipulate you. Get over what's happening to you, okay? And therefore, you will have a much better life. Firstly, going to schools is, very, is a key thing for me. Secondly, mm -hmm. I've got to go and keep doing the running, keep breaking the best records out there, try and be as good as I can be in the running, So, because then I can use the running as inspiration. So I'm bringing hope to many people, but I also have to try and bring inspiration. And by bringing inspiration is by bringing the running and everything else into it. And if I keep breaking uh, ridiculous records out there, um, then I'm able to bring some inspiration to people uh, and obviously bring the hope. So they're the two key thing to, yeah. to do is to keep trying to bring the, the hope and the inspiration and that's by going to schools by keep telling my story by keep doing the running and and hopefully eventually um uh, you know some people will see what i'm doing and therefore go and do something that tells about their lives and yeah. i've had many people so far say rob i've heard your story it's changed me what can i do about this i i, I give them my advice and they go and do it they go and do what you know, uh, what I've said, I met, I remember meeting on a train um, in America, on a train track, in the middle of nowhere, 20 miles around me, nothing. And for whatever reason, at that moment in time, I was there 
before she was about to commit suicide. And I, I, oh, I spoke yeah. to her, did lots of different things, and I found out that she was a brilliant cake maker. I said, what's holding you back? You, you've got nothing, blah, blah, blah. Lots of, lots of conversations, questions, everything else. And I said, just go and do your passion. Go and do what's right. Break away from those barriers, break those barriers apart, okay, and go and do it. You know what? She went and did it. You know what? She's a great cake maker now with a much better life. And she's, she's awesome. living in a great part of uh, uh, America. And this is what we need to do. We need to help each other yeah. to get through to those people what are in need, which is exactly what you're trying to do. And hopefully people will come out on the other end uh, knowing, hold on a minute, if this guy has seen the raping of his sister, if this guy has been hung, if this guy has watched his dog being killed, if this guy uh, is, is being dropped in a suitcase, if this guy is, is bled... If this guy uh, had a nail put through his foot, all these things that I've been through, okay. and yet I can go and do what I'm doing, why can't you go and do it? We all mm. have the ability to change our lives. And you know what? You can't keep dwelling on life. You can't keep dwelling to yourself. You've got to go and break those barriers and go and do something. Well, I couldn't have said it any better. <laughs> Thank you so much for that inspiration and absolutely, you know, bringing forward. There is hope for all of us, no matter what your story, no matter what your experience is, you know, get the support you need, get the help you need. But most importantly, I love what you're saying of just like do something, like get in there and dig at it and, and try and you will be able to break through and get to the other side. So thank you so much for those words of inspiration and encouragement today. And I just really want to thank you because, my goodness, I know there is so much on your plate and you're doing so many things. So it's such an honor to have had you here today. And I want to let everybody know who's listening that if you want to reach out to Rob, it's something that he's shared today has encouraged you, or if you want to learn more about, you know, what he's doing and even support his efforts, um, you can email him at info at marathonmanuk.com or go to his website, marathonmanuk.com and read more about them, support them, and, you know, think about your own, you know, road that you're running, the own own journey that you're on, and how you can continue to break through those barriers, as Rob has said. So, Rob, thank you again so much for being here today. No, thank you for having me, and uh, just one final word to, to everyone, just never give up. Have a bit of hope, have some faith in people, and go and trust people. There are many people out there what you can have, have, have some, I suppose, connection with. And, uh, and I'm one of those people that can try and connect with you, can try and help you, along with many other people like me. And you know what, there's so many groups out there what can help you. I said one word, right, and I'm going on. But just the moral of the story is just never give up and just keep fighting for what you believe in. And, and, and hopefully you can break through those barriers and go on and do something very good in your life. Absolutely. I agree 100%. Thank you so much. And I want to say thank you to everybody who's tuned in and joined us today. And don't forget to visit rachelgrantcoaching.com to learn more about sexual abuse recovery coaching and to explore the other resources that are available there on the site. And please be sure to subscribe to the podcast because we have so much more to share with you. So until next time, take good care of you.